along with three of the engineers who are sitting here who will be helping you with various aspects of the API, uh, build the map maker. Uh, but what we are here to talk about is um, how you can build uh, great applications yourself and uh, make the GeoWeb happen. Um, before I begin, I want to get a sense of uh, familiarity of um, the code base we're going to talk about uh, so that I can tailor my talk accordingly. Um, how many of you have, uh, how many of you are reasonably familiar with JavaScript? Okay, about half of you. Okay. Um, and uh, how many of you are reasonably familiar with uh, HTML and CSS? Okay, most of you. And uh, how many of you uh, have uh, done a Hello World or better in the Maps API itself? Okay. All right. So that's slightly difficult because about a third of you have seen the API before and others haven't. So I will try to um, go through the introductory parts of the API, but a little bit faster. Um, if anyone, uh, you know, is uh, confused or you, you think I have missed a step or something, it's most likely that I have been confusing you. Um, so just speak up and let me know because most of you, uh, if one of you thinks something is not clear, then probably most of you think the same. I want to keep this as interactive as possible as we go along. Um, how many of you heard of the term uh, GeoWeb? Can you lower this back, please? Okay. So the GeoWeb um, is this term we've been using for about four years to reflect um, organization of all information possible uh, geographically. And I will go through uh, why this is important. Um, there are three canonical ways of organizing information, traditionally and even today. Um, and we call them fail-safe ways because they are, uh, you define them using information theoretic, they are accurate. One of them is uh, search, which is, um, there is probably one result or one set of results that you have in mind when you express a search query. Um, and if the search engine does its job, then you get the right result. And chronologically, um, it's obviously canonically true um, because if you order it by time, then you, if you want to recall what happened yesterday, you know, newspapers are a classic example of chronological, chronological organization. And the other one is to draw it on a map. And uh, maps are, uh, reasonably important from uh, your points of view. Um, actually, I need to find out what kind of work you do. So we'll do that in a second. Um, so I think, this is my personal opinion, I think maps is a great way to organize information because it's the easiest from a user point of view. Um, you know, it's very easy for users to see where something is relative to other things that they're familiar with. Um, it's also very cool, right, very visual. Five-year-olds can understand uh, a map, but a five-year-old will be hard-pressed to understand search query. And it's very visceral. Um, so if you're in a time crunch or if you're in a stressful situation, um, which people often are on the internet where you're trying to go through a lot of pages, um, it's very useful to bring them, bring the information home by putting it on a map. Um, just so you can understand, how many of you are uh, uh, working for various organizations, um, like commercial organizations which are building applications for their business? And uh, of these, how many of our development shops and how many of our companies which have their own products? Uh, how many of our development shops and companies which have their own products? That's most of you. And the rest of you, how many of you are from the academia or working for NGOs and things like that? Okay. And uh, are the others are students or, I mean, I see, I saw about third of the hands not get raised. I was wondering if there was some, can people just speak up? They are from, if you're not from a commercial organization or from NGO, um, where are you from? Are you just a developer by yourself or how come you are here? I'm sorry? Okay. So why does maps matter um, from a business point of view and from your point of view? So there are um, reasonably uh, detailed studies done about geographic information. After this slide, you'll ask me why maps have been something that people have thought about recently, and we'll answer that. 
um, 80 percent of all business information. Um, this was study done recently by some uh, center for uh, business um, as a geocenter. So if you take um, something like a business's customer database, uh, customers have geographic centers. If you take their purchase-bills, the purchase—if a, a purchase came from a particular location and the customer who made the purchase came from a particular location, and so on. Um, and 90% or maybe more um, of our lives, even considering lives of the people in this room who happen to uh, have no clocks flying around the world, are also very local. Um, and here's an interesting stat that you know I find very hard to believe, but you can assert it's true. 80% of uh, people on the planet have never moved beyond 20 miles of their local life. And this is not because 80% of the planet is poor, it is because that's how people are. People are inherently local uh, animals. And 80% uh, of all money is spent locally. Now, many uh, clever economists would say that, hey, if you're saying 80%, 60% of all wealth is real estate, so maybe that is the case. But I'm excluding real estate in here. If you look at the money you spend, um, most of the money you spend would be to purchase something or to participate in an activity or get entertainment within 10 to 15 miles of where you're living. So that's why maps is so important. So how come um, maps is not more prevalent in uh, most information sites and so on? Well, because it's very hard. Um, most of the world is not mapped, and uh, building this stuff is hard, uh, and infrastructure to build and support a map happens to be very expensive. Um, most of the world is not mapped. Google has made its mission to map the world, so we're going to map it, um, and that will help. And making map uh, applications is difficult. It was difficult with uh, APIs from Google and from other companies. Building maps applications, simple maps applications, has become easier. Um, and uh, building more complex applications, stateful applications, has also become very easy if you combine things like uh, the map method. Um, with things like uh, MapMaker um, and the App Engine. Um, and uh, how many of you are in the Code Lab this afternoon? Okay. So um, Kaushik and Anish, who are going to uh, lead the Code Lab this afternoon, have put together a pretty cool app, which uh, takes you through step by step um, being able to build a application from scratch, uh, a mashup application from scratch. Uh, with a app engine component, so you can uh, go home feeling comfortable being able to build an uh, app engine plus mashup application and uh, use MapMaker to enhance your map stuff as well. So, um, why the API? Um, I just ran through some of the motivations, which is essentially make it easy. Um, you swallow a lot of HTML and JavaScript, you can build an API, you can get a map up, and start layering information on top of it. So the API allows you to do two things, which is one, uh, create a map element which contains the map, and uh, then uh, be, gives you uh, information tools which allow you to take information, layer it on the map, and interact with it. So here's a bunch of sites. Um, I won't take you through all of them. Maybe I'll pick one, um, which essentially layer information that they care about on the map. Uh, here's one because a lot of you are from uh, uh, commercial organizations. Um, here's one built by Toys R Us, which is a company that sells toys. And uh, if I take time away, so you can come in, so you get all the Toys R Us stores in Silicon Valley, and then you can go in and see Stan about. And all they did is when I hit enter here, uh, they made a database call to their database, um, fetched all the results, and uh, then computed a geographic center of all the stores that were in the results, in like five or six of them, and uh, set the map center there, and set the appropriate span of the map, um, and then put in markers with uh, their own marker icons uh, to place new locations on the map. And if I click on one of them, there's an info window with the information I need. So I can call them, and I can know the store hours, and uh, decide where to buy toys. So that's a um, that's actually not a very complicated app. Uh, you can, in, if you had the database uh, with App Engine, you do have such a database, uh, pretty easily accessible. If 
you have a, a database app, then building this matchup would be uh, probably half an hour for somebody, assuming you had GFI server as icon, uh, half an hour for somebody who is very, very familiar with the API, and if you're not familiar with the API, I would say four hours. Four hours? Less than that equally, right? Which is pretty smart. Um, so the API is a GLAM. Um, the heart of the API is GMAP2, the GMAP2 object, which essentially, essentially you need to invoke to create the map. Um, and then you have a bunch of uh, controls. Each of the elements um, in a, let me just, I'll use MapMaker as the classical um, API application because it has all the elements that we've been talking about. So each of these um, is, if you take the, Map control, zoom control, map type control, scale control, overview control, all of them are exposed here. Um, and each of these elements is something you can turn on or off. Because sometimes you want a very simple, small API app which is embedded with a lot of text, and sometimes you want a full-blown map like we have. And uh, having all the controls all the time is pretty painful. So you have control over what you want and what you don't want. And uh, there are different kinds of overlays you can have. Marker is a single point. Um, polyline and polygon are obvious. Um, that's a ground overlay where you can actually take um, a uh, image and paste it on the map, which is say particular that long. And then you have the info window, which uh, you can invoke when a user clicks on one of your uh, other overlays or other events you have set up. And then we also have pretty interesting overlays called the graphic overlays. Um, they allow you to layer on um, CML, and uh, <coughs> if and when uh, Street View is launched in India, you'll also be able to get Street View, which is use of the street um, in your own API. Um, our goal is, as a company, our goal is as following. Um, you should be able to build everything you see on maps.google.com using the API. We are not quite there yet, but that is the goal we are driving towards. And uh, we work very hard to expose everything we have inside the API. KML is essentially an XML format, uh, which um, was invented by Keyhole, the company that Google purchased, which became Google Earth. Um, and it has a particular DTD, which allows you to uh, specify um, geographic elements, like points and lines and so on, and text located geographically, and specify very fine-grained styles for that text. So you can actually have the painting of a dragon overlaid on a map, and if you zoom in, uh, the dragon will expand along with the map if you zoom out. So you can actually create complete pictures or doodles um, with KML. And you can have all kinds of other information. I won't go into it, but that's a whole separate thing. Um, and the services that are available inside uh, the API, of course, for India, we have not launched directly. Um, coming soon, I hope. Um, but you can get geocoding, which is you search for Bangalore, uh, and you send, send the query Bangalore to the geocoding API. It will return the center for Bangalore. Um, and you can also use AdSense, uh, which means if you are, you have built an application that your users like and you want to make some money, you can use AdSense to make money. Um, and uh, there's a whole bunch of utilities and components for you to make life simple. Um, I encourage you to use the G event utility uh, because it will make life much simpler. Um, if you're writing applications, the biggest source of memory leak and trouble is events. So the more you can encapsulate events, the better off you are. So let me give you a couple of examples of, uh, by the way, this entire presentation I'm giving is an API in itself. Um, so I enable the um, widget to do double click, and that happens. And uh, here are the controls. If I click on each of them, a control will appear. Um, so it's a pan and zoom control, just the zoom control, um, the map type on the upper right, and the scale at the bottom, and the overview map at the bottom right. Um, and you can have your own custom. And um, you can 
add content using uh, the marker info windows and polyline. I won't bore you with those. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. You define the marker, provide a center, and you set it um, similarly polyline. This is a little bit more interesting to do and stuff. Okay. So we get into events, and this is where the maps uh, become interesting. Um, it's fine to layer information, but if you want to make it interactive, you want to have your users have fun or do useful things with it, um, you want to have events. So rollover is a very simple example where there's an event. Um, you on mouse over of the marker, you change the color, and uh, you mouse out. And uh, set is uh, a very simple function which allows you to set the center of the map, so essentially jump to a new location. Um, by the way, we have the example code for all of these. Each of these is two or three lines. We can walk you through this uh, uh, in the afternoon or give you examples. And so that was not a bug. Um, if I mouse over this, it jumps to a random point. In addition to free food, this is one of the things we'll do with us later. Um, and the other one is the drag API, which is very cool. So if you look at the way it's working, there's a shadow it uh, casts as it moves around. And wherever you drop it, it will drop at the X. So I'll try to drop it on Russia. And it even bounces behind the X. And that bounce took some engineer, I think, three months to make. Um, Okay, so I'll show you my couple of my favorite uh, content overlays. Um, this I think is pretty cool. So we take, I mean, this is a very simple application where we took a satellite image of a island and overlaid it on um, the map of that island. So you can see part of this is in the map and then the actual image of the uh, coast. Um, map itself and it's a one simple call and after you do that any map operation I do this will stick to the map including zooming in and that is extremely valuable for example um, if you want to overlay somebody's campus map on uh, uh, the map and or if you want to overlay uh, for example if you're working for the fire department and you want to overlay the location of all the fire hydrants and stuff this stuff is pretty useful and the other one that I think is very cool is the traffic overlay. We don't have this information in India yet, but uh, we can run it on a Friday evening and we are still road in the Bay Area where there is traffic in San Francisco. Green is good traffic, yellow means there's a traffic jam happening. The San Francisco obviously. This area is where most of the clubs are, so obviously there's traffic. It's about 10.30 um, and their bars don't close at 11. Geocoding, very straightforward. Um, you do a search and you get the location. Okay. Um, now we will get to code. It's a very simple API application. Um, let me jump to the application and come back to the code. So the application is it. Uh, shows you the entire world view, um, picks the center of that, and puts a marker there, and uh, opens info windows all hello world. So how do you do that? Um, you have the standard HTML with the body and so on, and you define a uh, function called hello, and you call that function on load of the page. And um, the div ID map is pretty important. Um, we'll get to that. but. Note that the map has been defined with a size of 400 by 300. And uh, you instantiate the map using the new gmap2. Um, and you give it the div, um, which it is supposed to attach itself to. And then you create the center where you want. Uh, you create a variable uh, point, which is essentially a glat long object. Um, and then you set the center to that point at with the zoom level b. Um, and then once you're done with that, you create a marker called um, new marker with the same point that you set the center of the map to, and you add the overlay. Um, 
and then you open the info window with the like, and the info window can of course be opened with HTML. Um, so you can make this as fancy as you want. So if it's completely static, and to make this dynamic, uh, you would take something like this and uh, type something like this. So all of this is pretty straightforward. Um, there is one uh, difference for India, which is you don't necessarily always want to use the uh, classic um, you know, default GMAP2 application I gave you uh, in the example part because of the following reason. <laughs> so this is, uh, how many of you are from Bangalore by the way? Wow, quite a few, so you will understand this example. This area is Whitefield. Um, Probably about uh, 50,000 internet savvy people travel on this road every day, uh, back and forth. And uh, this area was reasonably well mapped um, to the extent that we could with the information we had um, by you know Googlers and uh, people working for Google um, a few months ago. So when we launched Maps for India, we used MapMaker internally to map uh, Whitefield, Bangalore, and 300 other cities, and we launched it. And that's how you have India Maps, by the way. All of India Maps are done using MapMaker. Um, and this is what you got. And a few weeks ago, I think six or seven weeks, we launched MapMaker. And the map of um, this part of Whitefield looks like this. So if you look at it, most of the roads were there because we could see it in the satellite imagery, but most of the points of interest we did not have because we didn't have enough local information or the people who did the sites did not have enough local information. Look at the comparison. Now, if you're building an API or building an application, you probably want the second tile set because it is a lot more fresh and so on. And uh, let me just pan around so you see the entire thing. So it's completely devoid of the deep local information that you expect a map to have. And now, the information from MapMaker takes a few months to get onto Maps, so this will happen, right? But um, if you are using um, the API, you probably want to use the fresh map one. And this is an example of how you do that. Um, this is the magic snippet, right? You load these two uh, additional files, um, and then you call this magic script, and then the rest of it is straightforward. The rest of it is just a regular API, and your geocoding and everything else will work as normal. And the only difference is you'll get the same satellite imagery, but the map files are from MapMaker, which are fresher, which are, you know, anytime you add information to it within eight hours or 10 hours, information shows up on the tiles, and uh, that's pretty good. So we literally have thousands of websites, actually four years ago, sorry. We literally have thousands of websites being built every year using the API, um, mainly because it's a few lines of code to build, so why would you not do it? So um, this is the example that Prasad Ram gave uh, in his talk, which is all the different uh, kinds of APIs that you can use to find, for example, real estate, which is in the US. We don't have APIs like this in India. I'm sure you guys are working on it. Um, So this is uh, hundreds of thousands, this is half a million, billion, 1.5 million, 2 million. If you look at websites like uh, Panoromeo, um, Trula, Yelp, and Breakthroughs, and so on, um, you can look at the number of unique users they are getting um, in the millions. And the uh, page views they get is probably five to 10 times that. So they have a huge amount of traffic um, and the heart of each of these websites is a map. And the API they use is Google Maps, of course. Um, and it's very clear to Google that all of the world's information is not going to be organized clearly by name, even though that's our mission. So it's, it's going to happen because other people have better ideas than us and they have more mo better motivation to build applications that a user's need. We don't understand all the users. 
So the expectation is that you know a few thousand engineers sitting inside Google cannot build all the applications that the people need, hence the API and hence the various use cases. Um, there are many ways to take information and expose it on the map, and uh, I'm going to point to a couple of ways, a uh, couple of traps that you uh, will uh, normally fall into. The simplest thing you can do is take your database, um, you know, say um, somebody has three points of interest, Dallas-Fort Worth, Stanford University, Googleplex, and uh, you, you know, do a loop like what Triceras did, did. Uh, get it from the database in a loop, set a marker, and uh, open the info window and so on. Um, the next best thing to do is to actually create a KML with this information. And I'll give an example of a KML. So create a KML, which is uh, as simple as doing something like this. You can either generate it with code, or otherwise um, let uh, Google index the KML file. Google and other search engines index the KML file. Um, and uh, magically, all of your data will get indexed. It will show up on Google.com, it will show up on Google Maps, and it will probably show up on other search engines as well. And that has the advantage where your data or data of your corporation, um, which your corporation wants people to see, or your organization wants people to see, will be visible to uh, everybody who wants to see it. Um, but if you do it in the previous approach, where you write it with code, um, only people from your, applica your uh, application can see it. Now obviously, if your that information is private, or if it is sensitive or it is your intellectual property, you don't want other people to have it, that's the way to do it. But if this information is something you, um, you think is public and you want to have more wide usability of it, this is the way to do it. And then you can use all kinds of uh, <coughs> tools to make it more accessible, like GeoRSS. Um, the combination of GeoRSS and Maplet is pretty powerful. How many of you know what a Maplet is? Okay, one, two people. We're going to get to a Maplet. So Maplet is a little map mashup sitting inside Map. So it can be used as a standalone application, or it can be used in Maps itself, um, so that people can uh, um, uh, people who are coming to Maps can get access to it. And the one reason why that is very important is uh, it is um, very hard for you to drive traffic to your website. Maps gets millions of users per day, and if your application is useful, exposing it in the map itself makes it uh, more accessible and you get more views that way. Let me show you an example of a maplet. I don't know if you saw the flicker, but the map of Myanmar on maps.google.com is blank. And if you open this maplet, you will see um, this data, this map which is not there uh, on maps.google.com. And this is a maplet that we created, our team created, um, because there was a cyclone in um, Burma, and uh, UN and other relief agencies needed this information. So in those days, MapMaker was not launched. So we actually generated all these files using MapMaker, turned it into a maplet, and put it out. So that people, and all of this happened from start to finish within four days. So people can get access to Burma Maps without having it available on MapMaker. Okay. Um, so maplet and uh, KML is one way of exposing information or having information index, there is an even better way, um, sorry about the slide, but there's an even better way of getting your information index, which is you go to mapmaker.google.com and simply add. If you, for example, um, if you're working for an organization that has a bunch of businesses, or if you're working for an organization that has schools, or um, is doing events and so on, the best way to do it is to put the data in the map uh, using MapMaker. It shows up um, in maps 
in a few months, and you can instantly use it using your API. Um, and the other advantage is that once data makes it into Google Maps, it will be useful on google.com as well as the geocoder and so on. And uh, there are other advantages, which is um, if you put in business information, the business information instantly shows up on google.com, our mobile search, and our voice search, um, which we are rolling out in India. Um, and this data will be updated and maintained by other users. So here's the big picture. Um, if it is core maps data, um, and you want your users to have good base map, drop it into MapMaker. If it is personal or non-factual information, uh, for example, you have your you know, school picnic, or you have a particular event that you're holding, and you want to have a detailed uh, outline of that event and so on, if it's non-factual information, put it in my maps, or put it in KML, and create a mobile version. Um, and there are different ways of using this information once you put it in. Um, a static map is how you embed a Google map into your um, log or your web page and so on. It's a single line of code. How many of you have used a static map before? Okay, a lot of you didn't. Uh, but it's literally you know one line of not even code. You embed it into even a blog or some other some other website you are adding information to. Um, maplets is in uh, like I mentioned is an interactive user interface inside Maps itself. It has a pretty interesting asynchronous architecture for every call that you make. It makes it slightly difficult to write, but the results are worth it. And Mashup is the classic Maps API which I gave you an introduction to. Um, and the new one that we released is a Flash API. Um, Flash has a lot of advantages um, where you can have faster user experience, especially in high latency countries like India. Um, and uh, Flash allows you a lot more control over the UI. Uh, and if you are somebody who knows action scripts, the Flash API is a pretty cool thing to use. So more about uh, Maplets. So here's how maplets are created. Um, so so the creation of a maplet um, is essentially you're creating a XML um, that uh, can then be pointed to a Google Maps user. And the hello world of a maplet is very similar to uh, creating a mashup. And if you notice, this is exactly the same except for this, this part. And then the bottom part corresponds to the C data. So what you did is you created a little uh, um, XML, which contains uh, a module with the following uh, magic scripts. And then you took your mashup and you put it inside the content. And then the C data is then um, rendered by the uh, map itself. So we're using two APIs now. You're using the maps API and you're using the gmodules API, um, which loads into maps into the mashup. Now coding maplets becomes uh, slightly tricky. Um, so in the Maps API, all you do is you know, think things like zoom equals get zoom, that gets the current zoom level, um, and then you have that information. And here you have to do something called a get zoom async, um, and then set the function in the callback um, to compute or to take action on whatever it is. So that creates one level of interaction that you'd rather do without, but you essentially have to do that so that users of maps are not inconvenienced um, while you're doing that. Okay, I'll skip all of this. So that's pretty much the end of the talk. Um, we have a longer, a slightly longer talk where we'll go through, so many of the examples I gave you, we'll actually show you the code snippets in the code lab and then walk you through a um, simple application lab. But do you have any questions in the meantime? Okay. Yeah. I'm 
sorry what was your uh, second last part of your question did we would not launch this call um okay this is a horrible my map i had created by the way so i have created a my map of the bay area let's assume i make it public this will never make it to mass.google.com other hand if you go to map maker if you look at the all this information this is the model everything you see here was you know done using map maker so when information flows into map maker using one of these add or edit things um and it goes through a moderation process and so on it gets baked into the core map um my map sits on top of map assumes there are maps and sits on top of maps um and information you put into my map public or otherwise uh, public all public means is it's searchable and indexed so people can click on your map and then expose your map but it, that data never makes it into the core map itself yeah my map is essentially public overlay a private overlay um this is a completely different animal i won't bore you with the technology but uh, information you given is synthesized into this global canvas Moderation process. Um, I probably have one feature that was denied, so I think I should take another one. I still have it in Google Moderator. We denied it. Um, so when you create an edit, um, if you are a new user to MapMaker, we don't know whether your data is good or not, or you have a habit of using this data or not. So what happens is mapmaker goes well um this user has given data but I don't have any confidence about this data one way or the other and there is some risk associated with this data going into a map therefore it kicks it into moderation and any other user who wants to moderate that I mean there's a moderation tab where you can go into moderate and if you're looking at that viewport things inside that viewport are visible to you and users with higher degrees of trust or higher expertise can then moderate that and say approve or deny or give a bunch of comments and once it's approved um that uh, gets approved and published instantly into the map and um another side effect happens which is your trust uh, in the system increases slightly and over time it's been a few edits um your edits start most of your edits start going live automatically but uh, not all map features are made equal right um editing um the shape of a park is less risky than editing the name of a business is less risky than editing the name of a city called delhi which one of our users tried um and uh, there are degrees of risk and there are degrees of trust so um and we do this uh, machine learning uh, intervention where we using learning we have learned some trust and then we match it against the risk level And all of that is designed to allow most of your edits to go live instantly without blocking you, while the really risky ones are moderated, so you have a map that is useful. Um, and most people like that. Oxy. Yeah. You mean the data itself? Yeah, the data is currently owned by Google. how many ways which we make this information publicly available um and we are working on other ways as well yes and no um we do have a pilot running so if you are an organization like an ngo who wants map data for your use i think we will entertain that um just come talk to me we have not declared a public policy about it but we are on a case by case basis um for example we are working with the un and so on giving the map data to certain people uh to see how it goes but our intention is to make this data as useful as possible so since you are from uh, an ngo come find me if you if you really want this data yeah um, 
mapmaker mapmaker is entirely done using uh, javascript api we have one person in our team who is hell bent on creating a flash version and he's working on it in his spare time but uh, this was just a choice it just happened that most of us were more familiar with javascript so we there's no reason not to use the flash version actually there was when we started working on this there was no flash version So you're asking whether Google is building a JavaScript to actually support flash version. Right. Hmm? That's in flash, but they wrote actually. Okay. Um, so you just gave me an idea for a new product, but I don't think anybody's working on it. That's a good idea. Not necessarily. You can have action script on the client as well. Let me show you. So this is all flash. If you ever use Google Finance. All built using Flash, but um, I'm not quite a expert in Action Script to quite know the answer to your question. So you're asking whether I can call a Flash object from a 